Hey there, what's happening? Welcome to the Everything 80s Podcast Movie Review. I'm Jamie. Thanks for coming on out. And today we are looking at Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I will be reviewing all three, not in a row, but over three separate episodes of the original trilogy. And the less we say about the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, the better. Actually, I'll touch on that later in other episodes. But today, of course, we're looking at the one that started it all, the 1981 classic action-adventure film directed by Steven Spielberg, uh, with, created and produced by George Lucas. Let's have a quick look at the plot and the summary of the whole thing, and then we'll look at more about how the movie was made, some behind-the-scenes things, and then even some, uh, you know, some of the different themes that were explored over the course of this movie. Okay, so we start out, and it's 1936. We meet archaeologist Indiana Jones, and he is attempting to work his way through this ancient booby trap temple while in Peru, and he's trying to retrieve a golden idol. So he has to go through these various challenges. Uh, he's got to deal with some guides who end up turning on him. Uh, he's confronted by rival archaeologists and then a bunch of the indigenous population around there. He's, you know, works his way through. We got the famous scene with the giant boulder and him, you know, trying to escape, reaching back, grabbing his hat. That was also perfectly parodied in the UHF movie, which I hope you've seen. So eventually, as he makes his way out, he finds himself surrounded, completely outnumbered, and he has to surrender the idol. But he manages to escape on a waiting seaplane that he uh, is able to quickly get to take off, well, even though finding a snake in it. So we're now um, at Marshall College, where Indiana Jones is a lecturer and professor, and two army intelligence agents are interviewing him, and they inform him that the Nazis are working with his former mentor named um, Abner Ravenwood. So he stu Jones studied under him at the University of Chicago. So the Nazis know that Ravenwood is the leading expert on the ancient city called Tanis in Egypt, and that uh, he possesses this headpiece from an ancient uh, Egyptian artifact that's called the Staff of Ra. So Jones figures out that the Nazis are trying to find the Ark of the Covenant, believing it will grant their armies like pure invincibility and the, be able to summon otherworldly powers and, you know, to take over the world. So the agents then turn to Jones to help recover the Ark. He's their He's their only hope. So he travels to Nepal and discovers that Ravenwood has actually died. And the headpiece is in the possession of his daughter named Marion. So uh, Indiana goes to visit her at a tavern she runs before this group of thugs with their head Nazi commander, Arnold Tote, uh, uh, show up. They're also seeking the headpiece. So there's a whole gunfight in the bar. The bar ends up catching fire. Uh, the headpiece is in flames. Then we see the you know iconic image of uh, Todd severely bur burning his hand trying to retrieve it, having to jump outside, put it in the snow. But the emblem is now embedded in his hand, just like in Home Alone. So uh, Jones and Marion escape with the headpiece, and Marion decides to accompany him on the search. So they end up traveling to Cairo, where they meet up with Jones' friend and a skilled digger. Uh, named Salah, he informs him that uh, that the Nazis and um, his other you know adversaries are digging for what's called the Well of Souls, which is believed to lead to the Ark's location. And they've got a replica of the headpiece created from the scar on Tot's hand. So Jones and Marion, uh, they end up being attacked by a group of Nazi soldiers. It seems like she is killed in an explosion during the whole chase and the chaos that's going on. Jones ends up regrouping with Sala, and they realize the Nazi headpiece is actually incomplete. So when it's all lined up uh, in this sort of scale model of the city and it shines a light through to shows the exact location of where they should be looking, but it turns out they're digging in the wrong place because they don't have 
um, the proper, the, the base of the whole headpiece is not in the, the right formation. So they only have a little bit of the information. So they're sort of in the area, but not close enough. So uh, there's a confrontation in one of the local bars and Jones and uh, Salah are able to find where the Nazis are digging. Jones ends up actually finding Marion alive in one of the tents. Doesn't set her free though, because he doesn't want to alert the Nazis. So he leaves her there with promises to come back later. So now they find this tomb and, and the well of the souls and Jones uses the staff and the that now the properly formatted headpiece to um, get his what first he gets his way down he has to fend off a bunch of snakes using fire and gasoline and then he reaches the gets himself down there and is able to locate the precise spot then he works his way up to the right location that they he ends up find, getting his way down into the sort of empty chamber finds the stone coffin that contains the ark the meantime, though, the Nazi officers and uh, Tote and everyone basically comes down, realizes what's happening, and they seize the Ark from Jones. Then they imprison him and Marion in the crypt, but they're able to both escape to one of the, the airstrips nearby where they're trying to take off with the Ark of the Covenant. Then Indiana gets in this fist fight with a classic scene with one of the mechanics, ends up destroying... Um, the flying wing that was to transport the Ark back to Berlin, Germany. So then the the Nazis panic. They put the Ark onto a truck. Indiana manages to catch up on horseback. He hijacks the truck, defeats the Nazis. Then he makes arrangements to transport the Ark to London on a tramp steamer called the Bantu Wind. So in the cargo hold, now we start seeing that there's some sort of mysterious forces that do actually surround the Ark. And these forces burn the Nazi symbols painted on the wooden crate containing the Ark. So the next day, a U-boat intercepts the ship. Then Todd and his crew, they seize the Ark and Marion, but they cannot find Indiana, who stows away aboard the U-boat and then travels with them to an island. Um, And once they get to that island, they want to test the power of the Ark before ultimately this whole idea is to get this thing to Hitler. So Jones eventually uh, reveals himself and threatens to destroy the Ark with a rocket, but they call his bluff knowing he's not going to do it just because of whatever powers this thing's possessed. Plus they know Indiana is so partial to artifacts and archaeology, he would not dare to destroy this ancient relic. So the Nazis take him and Marion to an area where the Ark will be opened and they tie him to a pole so that they have to watch it. So they perform, um, the Nazis and perform this whole ceremonial opening of the Ark and they do the full prayer, but they find out that the whole thing is full of sand and that they think that's what was left over of the Ten Commandments, the actual Ten Commandments written in stone. So Indiana's realizing what's going to happen and tells Marion to keep her eyes shut because then all these spirits start flying out of the ark and essentially are the angels of death. So flames are now forming above the ark. The whole climate's changing. Bolts of energy shoot through all the soldiers, killing them. The extreme heat. Uh, the people be- become mummified. Tot's face melts and right off his skull. People's heads explode. Flame- and then basically everyone who is watching and looking at this thing is basically killed except for Jones and Marion because they have avoided looking at it. And in a whirlwind of uh, fire that's gone all around them before the Ark eventually seals itself shut, leaving both of them safe then they open their eyes, uh, they realize what's happened and, you know, embrace and are happy they made it through. So now we're back in, as the movie winds down, we're back in Washington, D.C. So the Army intelligence agents tell Jones and Marcus Brody that the U.S. government has already paid them a huge sum to secure the Ark. The Army intelligence Uh, Agents then tell them that the Ark is in a pre-secured and heavily guarded undisclosed location. So the whole that this Ark and this um, artifact of whatever it is, is going to be studied and monitored by, quote, top men, unquote. We then see a sealed, uh, the Ark, assumingly in a sealed wooden crate that is stored in a giant government warehouse among countless 
other crates in one of the most famous endings in movie history. Okay, so let's start breaking this whole thing down. And I just, you know, rewatched it the other day. And, you know, it, to say, like, you almost forget how good this movie is, but it's not that you haven't forgot it. It's like you reappreciate it. And again, like, it's the movie that started off this amazing trilogy. And it's crazy to think that this movie came out all the way back in 1981. It's that old. But, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark was the perfect action-adventure movie and gave us this brand-new hero. We already had Han Solo, um, obviously played by Harrison Ford, too, but now we have this other amazing, iconic hero just a few years apart. So in this movie, we get all these um, elements that make it incredible, like the iconic hero, the action adventure, the Nazis, the biblical mythology, all wrapped together. We just hadn't seen anything really like that before. Not since the early uh, Saturday matinee serials of the 1930s and 40s, which were a huge influence on George Lucas and both Steven Spielberg. And they were action adventure and, you know, stories of Buck Rogers and spaghetti westerns and people riding off into the sunset and shows that ended with cliffhangers and all these elements, which worked so well in the 30s, 30s and 40s, obviously worked again going into the 80s and 90s and everything like that. You, you look back on the movie, the special effects obviously don't hold up, but they were there to serve the story. They weren't there just for the sake of special effects, which obviously a lot of movies fall prey to. So since that they're used to serve the story, they still work. You know what I mean? They still hold up in that sense. So looking at a few interesting things off the bat. So the first one is that Harrison Ford was never the first choice to play Indiana Jones. They were always going to go with Tom Selleck. They weren't... Um, you know, George Lucas thought he didn't want to have this guy who's already Han Solo be his like go-to guy, like he was Robert De Niro or Johnny Depp is with Tim Burton or whatever. Um, so Tom Selleck was the the original choice, who I definitely could have seen making this work. But there were some scheduling issues that came up that you know, revolved around another 80s classic that Selleck would be in, Magnum P.I., so he ended up going with that. They were also considering David Hasselhoff, uh, even Mark Harmon, before everything worked out with Harrison Ford. So Lucas like also said he was never thinking about Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones, Indiana Jones because, again, not just having him be the go-to guy, he was already way too identified as Han Solo. Steven Spielberg, though, had loved his work in Star Wars because uh, he had, you know, seen, you know, this goes back to the early days, like 76, 1977, 1978. George Lucas had these ideas already for... Um, Indiana Jones. So, and, you know, he's filming Star Wars 2 at the same time. So, Steven Spielberg is seeing uh, this guy on screen and he's thinking, this is uh, this is the perfect guy for Indiana Jones. And a lot of the character of Indiana Jones was already written on the page. And a lot of uh, what Indiana Jones is, is kind of based on a few different people from real life. And I wrote a whole blog post on this. If you either want to click on the link in whatever description on whatever platform you're listening on, there should be a link there. Or if you go to everything80spodcast.com slash Jones, I've got a whole blog about all the different people that, uh, well, it's actually three main ones that influenced Indiana Jones from real life. So the thing is, you know, a lot of the character was already written on the page, but Harrison Ford took it to a better level than they were expecting with his interpretation of this character and same thing he did with Han Solo uh, and you know and his performance so George Lucas states again he's talking about what was already written down on paper he he says in different interviews that Raiders of the Lost Ark came together as smoothly as a movie could and as smoothly as any movie he's ever made and that he considers it the most fun he's ever had making a movie so it all started with the script written by Lawrence it's Kasdan who wrote The Empire Strikes Back, which is considered, well, and to me and to a lot of people, the greatest of all the Star Wars movies. Really, not much was altered from the script to the final product, which does not happen a lot. Everything as far as the scenes, the characters, the, the character beats, um, the energy, like everything that they wrote pretty much ended up on screen. And I think that led to the real, the smoothness of the filming. And another aspect of this was because Steven Spielberg uh, made it a point to make this project a lot tighter 
and a lot more focus because he was notorious for going over budget and over time with shooting schedules, specifically like say a movie like Jaws took an extra hundred days over what it was supposed to take because he's just trying to get every possible shot and angle and the movie loses a lot of its freshness um, and energy from that. But with Raiders of the Lost Ark, Spielberg made it a point to stay on track to prove to himself and to George Lucas that he could do it. So they actually finished about 12 days earlier than expected. And this, again, leads to very little wasted shots and time and that um, it gives the movie its great energy and its really good pacing because, you know, they're not second guessing um, setups and shots and they're going with their first um, inclinations and that or, or takes and those usually end up being the best one. So, okay, Raiders of the Lost Ark comes out on June 12th, 1981 and is a massive hit. Uh, like, you know, blockbuster is not really being a big thing, but, you know, Star Wars, obviously, but we're still not into blockbuster territory yet. Uh, E.T. would be the next one that would come out in 82. And as we get in the mid 80s, blockbusters become more common, but they weren't until Star Wars, you know, that um, happening that often. Uh, so it was a just a like critical and commercial massive hit. So on the first weekend, it made around $8 million, which converted for today is still only around $22 million. But you have to consider that movies opened on way fewer screens back then. Raiders of the Lost Ark was shown on only 1,078 screens. If you compare that to today, like Marvel and Disney movies that open on close to 4,000 screens, it was just, you know, that tough to make these huge opening uh, impacts as far as box office, but it still did because of how successful and how good the word of mouth was. So it ended up making an astonishing $385 million, which converted for today is well over a billion dollars. Um, it was again, not only like this commercial hit, it was a massive critical hit and that just kept the momentum going. They figure that Raiders of the Lost Ark sold 70, or sorry, 70 million movie tickets. So when you adjust it for inflation, it remains one of the highest grossing movies ever made. Okay, so let's look at some behind the scenes things with Raiders of the Lost Ark. One of the most interesting is that every single person filming this movie got sick with a massive um, sort of run of food poisoning that went through everyone, all the crew, all the cast, except one person, Steven Spielberg. Somehow it, he avoided it, but they got really sick. And this actually translates to on screen, specifically the scene where Indiana's in the market and the attacker with the big swords is doing all his moves and we think we're in for this epic fight and Indiana just pulls out the gun and shoots him. That was because Harrison Ford was having such severe, let's call it gastrointestinal issues from the food poisoning. He could barely perform and do anything. And he came up with that idea on the spot because he just honestly couldn't do anything else. And then they realized that was such a brilliant move, just pulling out the gun and shooting them. Spielberg loved it. And again, it's, you know, one of the most famous scenes in movie history. Interesting thing with the, the melting face scene when the art gets opened up, that almost gave this movie an R rating, which would have crushed it as far as any form of commercial success because the amount of kids and younger people would not have been allowed to see it. And that was a huge point of the movie is that they were able to remember like merchandising and toys wasn't a real thing. Star Wars obviously did it, but a lot, you know, that still wasn't a normal thing. Um, Raiders of the Lost Ark, they knew they could capitalize on the success with kids you know, toys, lunchboxes, the whole thing. Actually, the very first video game ever made based on a movie was Raiders of the Lost Ark that came out for the Atari. So the whole thing is the, the R rating would have killed it, but they had to fight to keep it out. And this would end up with other issues of rating, specifically that would happen with the uh, with Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And I'll cover that in the movie review for that one. And it has to do with the creation of the PG-13 rating. And, you know, so all this was sort of starting back with Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, other interesting behind the scenes thing, Harrison Ford has no real fear of snakes, which is one of the main characteristics of Indiana Jones. Neither does Spielberg, so it's interesting where they got that trait from. 
And, and one last one, and probably one of the greatest Easter eggs ever, and you might not know this, but in the opening scene when he's in the temple, on one of the walls behind him when he's going in um, and trying to get that golden idol, on one of the walls with the hieroglyphics, you can actually see an image of C-3PO and R2-D2. It's on, on one of those scenes where it's kind of locked in and there's hierogly- hieroglyphics uh, behind them. It's on the bottom left corner. So a great Easter egg, or you know, it's alluding to the fact that Star Wars and Indiana Jones exist in the same universe. Either way, it's awesome. Okay, so let's look at a few of the themes of this movie. Um, not, not like super, super profound. And that's the interesting thing with, and that's what makes movies and art so great is because y- your interpretations can find these different themes. And um, some are always specifically put in there by the creators of the movie. And then sometimes they leave it open and see what people dig up. But a few that seem, um, I think, specifically interesting uh, is one of the main ones that there's a lot more to life than can be explained by science. And it, it gets a bit spiritual, but this there's always been this biblical religious connection to the Indiana Jones movies. And they make it a point that he's all about science and he always believes in facts. And he's not about, you know, mythology or fairy tales or anything like that, but he's always confronted by the supernatural and things that can't be explained with facts and science and a real theme like you really can't ignore depending on on your viewpoints but it's that whole idea of the of faith or in the case of Raiders of the Lost Ark the power of God or that there's something bigger than man um, as all the movies have explored this theme and I think it comes down to really that idea about having to open your mind up to new ideas um, and not being so regimented in your thinking uh, this It doesn't have to mean uh, religion or God per se, but just not being stuck in your self-limiting beliefs, which Indiana Jones does, even though he's about the science and the fact he is aware of opening himself up to more. They, and one other theme I noticed that has been sort of prevalent through Raiders of the Lost Ark is the idea of, of selflessness and, and giving back to others or to the world. So Indiana Jones, as much as like of a jerk and a badass that he is, he, you know, him personally, he could be a multimillionaire and just gallivant around the globe living off the treasures he discovered uh, and ignoring everything else, but he gives back. He teaches young people at a really small college when he doesn't really need to be there, but he wants to share his wisdom and knowledge with the world. Um, he could all, Again, he could also keep everything he finds just to himself, um, but he doesn't do that because of this idea of the importance of selflessness and to share what you have or what you discru- discover with the world. Wisdom and knowledge are only useful when they are passed on, and that's really what the character of Indiana Jones is all about. So, just a couple interesting themes there. You might have your own takes on it or your, more, your own interpretations, but uh, a couple that I find interesting. So we'll wrap it up there. Thanks for listening. The next episode, we'll be covering Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. If you like this show, make sure you subscribe wherever you find your podcast. I should be there. If you really like it, give it a rating and review. That helps me out. But again, thank you for your time. I'll see you on the next one. Don't you dare miss it.